Um, our next guest, which means I need to move on. Our next guest is Ishmael Ahmed from World Remit, and our next moderator is Matthew Lindley. Please welcome them to the stage. All right, well, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so there was a estimate by the World Bank not too long ago that remittances was going to break like a $600 billion business. Was that lowballing it at all? Or do you feel like that was pretty accurate? Well, I think we think that's an underestimation of the size of uh, global remittances because uh, big, a big chunk of uh, remittances still go through informal channels, so difficult to estimate those. So, uh, but, but we think that, the, you know, the uh, actual size of total remittance could be even bigger than the $600 billion, yeah. I and mean, a huge, uh, huge uh, market. So. So, and what do you think is the, what's spurning that growth? Uh, the uh, migration, there are 250 million people who live outside their home countries. And migration is still continuing, so those are sending money back home. Mm -hmm. And, and that has been the case, you know, the last 30, 40 years. But uh, historically, the bulk of remittances used to go through informal channels. It was unmeasured, so we didn't know. But now, after 9-11 and the introduction of uh, tough new regulations, uh, money uh, flowing across borders has to be uh, measured. So that's why we hear a lot about uh, uh, remittances. And so how big do you think it could be in the next, you know, five years or so? I mean, it's growing seven, eight uh, percent every year, uh, and so so that that, that is still uh, continuing. And migration is still continuing. I mean, uh, we often hear migration, people coming to Europe, or North America, but the bulk of migration is within the South. Mm -hmm. So that is still continuing. So a big chunk of remittances are flowing between uh, developing countries. So for your personal growth strategy, do you focus more from a kind of bottom up? approach where you're, you're entering country by country, you're bringing people who are locals in, talking to people, the local governments, things like that, in order to establish an initial user base and kind of let it spread organically from there? The, I mean, we work with uh, migrants or who are sending money back home, but uh, most of the recipients are often unbanked. I mean, the reality is that we take for granted access to financial services, but uh, there are two billion people who are unbanked and whose life revolves around cash. Mm -hmm. And so that means, you know, even saving money under the mattress. Uh, but uh, that is now changing because of mobile money. Uh, and what is mobile money? Mobile money means somebody with a basic feature phone mm -hmm. uh, who can open an account where the mobile number becomes the account number. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so today we have 411 million people who have uh, mobile money accounts. So we work with the telcos that have launched these successful mobile money services. And so when we launched uh, five years ago, 100% of our transactions were cash on the, rec in the receive side. The send side was digital because we're an online business. Uh, that has now changed, and about two-thirds of our transactions are digital now, largely because of the uh, mobile money uh, services. Mm -hmm. And so I, we were talking backstage a little bit about one of, your, one of the first partners you worked with was M-Pesa. What was that conversation like? You know, wh did they think you were crazy? Did they think it was a great idea? I mean, M-Pesa was, was launched while I was at the UN uh, in Nairobi, so that was uh, before I launched World Remit. Uh, and at the time, I knew it was going to be successful because, uh, you know, mobile money services are financial services not run by banks and uh, car schemes, but by telcos, telcos that understand their customers better than banks. And uh, so, and, and, they, they, and they target the bottom of the pyramid, you know, people who are unbanked, who have been excluded by the formal financial services. Uh, 
uh, and, and therefore, so from the beginning we knew this was going to be successful. So as soon as we started uh, World Remit, and Beso was one of the first telcos we launched, uh, we, we contacted to work with them. Did they uh, contact you or the other way around? No, we contacted them because I think initially a lot of the uh, mobile money operators focused on building successful domestic money transfers which enables people to transfer money locally. But then we saw the opportunity of connecting those recipients to, the, uh, to their families abroad. And so if you look at that, I mean, we, we, Ambassador was the first one, but today we have 274 successful mobile money services. And there are another 100 that are currently being uh, launched. Uh, uh, so all around uh, the world then? Or? All around the world. Initially, I think Africa led the way, so Ambassador yeah. was the first uh, uh, successful one. But now you have uh, Tigo in Latin America, you have you know, Smart in Philippines. I mean, it's across uh, you know, Africa, Latin America, Asia. And uh, uh, we often use uh, Zimbabwe as an example of a country where we, the first three years of our business, we had only cash pickup uh, services. And typically recipients used to travel to the main city where we had a, a partner with physical locations to collect cash. And to collect uh, $100 used to cost around $10, 15 dollars. To just drive back and forth from? Somebody, you know, taking a transport from a rural village to the city just to uh, collect uh, $100. And, and often it was, uh, often it was uh, men who used to go to the cities to collect money and uh, take a cut <laughs> when, they, when they go back. And we, we talk about a uh, man in the middle type of attack. Uh, like a beer tax or something yes. like that? <laughs> the, uh, today, those recipients are getting their money on the mobile money uh, service uh, launched by the local telco, EcoCash. And saving the 15, 20, uh, 15 dollars they went to, used to spend to uh, uh, collect cash. And then also, funders are going to the actual beneficiaries, uh, which are often ma women who manage uh, things when, when finances are very tight, sort of. So, so the man in the middle is, uh, you know, the, the mobile money service have removed from the man in the middle, the guy who used to collect uh, cash. Yes. So I think we talked about this a little bit before, again, backstage, you know, that a lot of these emerging markets just kind of skipped credit cards or skipped over banking and went straight to mobile money operators. Is that evident that the ecosystem in these emerging markets is going to kind of diverge from traditional payment behavior or is it, does it all eventually converge to what we see in develop, de developing markets? Yes, they have leapfrogged into what is increasingly becoming ca due to cashless economies. Uh, I think what has helped them to do that was because they do not, they, they're not using uh, archaic legacy banking systems. Uh, they don't have to rely on uh, credit cards, uh, Visa and MasterCard. And I mean, yesterday I took my car to a, a, a local car wash, hand car wash. And every time I do that, I forget to collect cash because the guy who does that doesn't accept cash because the, the card schemes are a, a kind of a, a relic of the past. And so to accept money digitally, you need a, a card processing a terminal. You need to have a relation with a bank. Uh, you have to agree 3% card charges. There is a transaction disputes, delayed settlement. The, the, it may take three to 28 days to receive the money. Exactly a, a year ago when I was in Hargeisa, Somaliland, I, I did the same thing and took my uh, car to a car washer. He was able to accept uh, digital money because, and I didn't use my Visa or MasterCard, but I used a, a mobile money payment. It was instant, so he got the money instantly. No delayed settlement. Uh, he only had a mobile phone and he was registered to have a mobile money account. And, and, and he didn't have to worry about the uh, relation with the bank, payment process, and all those problems we see. And, and you can see that why mobile money services have been hugely successful in emerging markets because uh, they don't have to follow uh, Visa and uh, uh, MasterCard uh, rules or the complicated banking uh, networks. Also, 
getting to MasterCard and Visa, when you're expanding into new markets, I imagine you have to work with sort of local regulators and governments and things like that. Those larger companies, they have a lot of resources. They may have connections that you might not have or other startups in this space might not have. Is it a concern at all that they can use that influence to kind of chart the development of these technologies and that you might not have a say at all in what's going to happen with that? Well, uh, uh, credit card schemes have tried to replicate what they have here in the West, in the developing countries. But those have not worked largely. Of course, often working with banks. And I mean, take the case of Kenya. I mean, the banks tried every trick in the book to, uh, every trick to stop M-Pesa because uh, the, the local payment method in Kenya is not Visa or MasterCard or banks. It's a, it's a local mo mobile money. So initially the argument was that uh, uh, a telco that was not licensed by the central bank was doing this. And, and I think the, we talk, and I think a lot of uh, mobile money services succeeded because the Kenya central bank allowed M-Pesa because it was hugely popular, it was hugely successful to uh, continue without uh, forcing them to work with banks. Uh, current schemes and banks convinced some of the countries, particularly in Africa, to connect mobile money services to banks, so those are bank-led. And virtually all the bank and mobile money services have largely failed. So of course the card schemes wanted to replicate what we, they have got here, where you have to pay 3% to a payment, but that has not worked largely. So if it hasn't worked, have they been trying to talk to you at all? Maybe they want to go ahead and buy you and just skip the whole process of doing that? No, I think uh, you know, Visa and MasterCard work with banks. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't uh, work directly with consumers. Uh, so, so their relationships are, uh, you know, building uh, the platforms uh, that, that process the uh, payments. So I think I know, I mean, if in particular, MasterCard is currently involved in uh, digital identity projects uh, in some countries like Nigeria where they are trying to also host the payment methods locally once their digital identity uh, system is accepted. But that has been uh, very controversial uh, uh, because of the, 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 you know, uh, digital identity is very uh, critical for financial inclusion. But uh, kind of schemes have not been largely successful in kind of uh, 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 increasing financial inclusion. So they never tried to talk to buy you guys? Uh, I think uh, from what we understand, the uh, card schemes focus on B2B rather than B2C. We're a B2C company. Okay. No heated conversations with them? Uh, no, in some ways, obviously, in the sense that we work with, the, you know, we have to work with the card schemes because we, uh, or on banks, because we, half of the payments uh, we accept come from uh, Visa and MasterCard. Uh, the other half are alternative methods, which I think in also in the development market is we see a shift from card schemes to alternative payments. Just because it's cheaper? Uh, cheaper, faster. Uh, when, when we started, it used to take us 14 days or longer. We had deferred settlement with our bank to get money. Uh, and so I think for a lot of startups, the biggest issue is uh, you don't get the money once you process a card. Mm -hmm. So of course, we, in a lot of our set marketers, we looked for alternative payment methods where we could get the money uh, same day or instantly. So in the case of Netherlands, for instance, uh, Ideal, which is a local payment method, uh, accounts for more than 80% of our transactions. In, uh, Australia, uh, the alternative payment method is again one of the largest uh, payment methods from us. Uh, so forth in Germany, uh, Interact Online in Canada. So that's how half of our payments come from alternative payments. So for you or any other startup that's kind of touching this space at all, like what would, what would keep you up at night? What, what worries you about these larger companies? The, I think in the early stage, it's really about how do you get your money quickly. I mean, I remember uh, we were in December, uh, I think our first December, December 2011, 
we had a deferred settlement, which was, well, they say it was 14 days, but actually we used to get the money on the 19th, so the 18th day. And then add that to the Christmas closures. So in December 2011, <laughs> something like 70, 80% of the funds we processed that month uh, were delayed. And in international money transfers, we guaranteed instant credit. Uh, instant uh, transfer. So, so to do that, we often pre-fund and put our money in uh, so, so with, with, with correspondents in Philippines, Africa, Latin America. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's uh, for a lot of payment companies, and especially when you're early stage, you know, cash flow is, the, is, is, is critical. And you, we have a card scheme set up to actually stifle innovation because you can't really, a lot of, I know in our space, uh, a lot of companies failed because they couldn't really uh, raise money enough for them to do that, that, that sort of, uh, you know, funding the transactions for like uh, 28 days. So a lot of your business comes from kind of like you said, transactions coming from developed markets to developing markets, right? We've seen in 2016 this incredibly unexpected rise or maybe expected rise of nationalism and kind of anti-immigration sentiment. Do you, how is that going to affect your business going forward? Well, um, migration is a, a fact of life now. And as, as long as we have wage and quality of life differential, uh, migration will continue. And, and, and it will also particularly continue in the South. As I said earlier, the bulk of the 250 million migrants don't live in Europe or North America, they live in Asia, Latin America, Africa. So uh, we, we think migration will still continue. Uh, and obviously, I think the quality of life differential is some, sometimes somewhat accentuated, exaggerated by pictures, you know, people watch on Facebook. So when you talk to families in Africa who, uh, who, who, saw, who see, see uh, their children taking the boats, they often complain about Facebook pictures. So those, uh, uh, you know, boys when they see someone uh, maybe in London or uh, you know Sydney, they often think that the quality of life is far superior to what they are used to. But I think, the, the, but it's the way to differentiate really, which is driving that. So I, we think that will still continue. So I mean, even if freedom of movement started to be restricted, you know, do you have maybe a strategy in place just in case that happens? I mean, my. Migration, you know, the remittances, we're talking about $600 billion uh, industry, so it's still uh, people will continue to uh, transfer funds across borders. Uh, and, you know, uh, migration has been part of uh, civilization. Migration uh, increased as part of globalization, so we, we, we don't think that will change. And even with the rise of nationaliz nationalism, you don't think it's possible that regulators may decide to come after you, come after your business? No, I mean, re regulators are interested to make sure the remittances or international cross-border payments go through formal channels. Uh, you know, part of the problems we had historically was that uh, uh, the bulk of remittances, more than 50% of the $600 billion used to go through and regulated and grand networks. Uh, we often uh, talk about Hawala networks, uh, where we, which were trade-based remittances. We don't want to go back to those uh, networks, so I don't think there is any regulator which will uh, restrict the formal flows of remittances. And that includes in the USA. I don't think uh, remittances from USA to Mexico will be stopped because uh, the because we, the governments and regulators know the costs of underground illegal uh, flows of uh, remittances. So just real fast, because I think we're running out of time. You mentioned that these payments are being tracked more formally and you're getting more data on how people are paying their bills and things yeah. like that. Does this help them establish kind of like a de facto credit score of sorts? In uh, particularly where funds are sent to mobile money, the unbanked people who never had any data that can support whether they can borrow money, yes, the, the, 
the, the volume, the, both the domestic money transfers and international remittances they are receiving can now be used to assess uh, uh, some of those people, you know, for, for, for things like uh, critiques. And, 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 and I think it's great that, uh, you know, f uh, mobile money services are run by telcos because uh, telcos know their customers better than banks and they have a huge amount of data which is critical, particularly if a transaction becomes uh, suspicious, because not only do they have the, who the person is connected to or the, uh, their address book, but they even know where the person is positioned, located, uh, what they do, they have got both the call data as well as the uh, transactions of, of, cool. of the customer. Cool, well thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, we are going to a short break. Please remember to check out the Startup Alley and vote for your favorite company within the app and uh, relieve yourself in the restroom and then join us in about five minutes, please. Thank you. <laughs>